A hidden world that nobody has been able to reach for centuries. I'm just spitballing here, but that does sound like a place that someone could call home. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and today we're going to talk about Jedi Survivor. That is the awesome new canon game that's a sequel to Fallen Order. Now, I know some of you like to keep up on all the Star Wars canon, but maybe you're not gamers. Or maybe you've played the game, but you just want to learn about some of the Easter eggs. So we are here to recap the game's story and talk about some of the really cool Star Wars references. We also did a recap of the events of the first game. Check that out if you have time. After years of waiting and a few development delays, Cal Kestis is finally back on the Mantis in Jedi Survivor. The game was an absolute blast and we would highly recommend it to any Star Wars fan out there. The storyline alone is not only a better version of the entire plot of Kenobi, but it also has big implications for the Star Wars universe at large. Yeah, I've been dying to know what happens in the game. Oh, you haven't played Survivor? Man, I, I don't have any thumbs. Oh. That's right. Well, in that case, let's talk about the plot of Jedi Survivor and what its story means for the Star Wars universe, for all our thumbless viewers out there. The game opens in Coruscant, a seamless transition from the start screen. Cal is surrounded by guards, two of which are Clatoonian, almost always presented as bad guys, who have detained Cal and are bringing him in for questioning by a galactic senator. I'll find out one way or another. Sometimes all it takes is a speech. Now it turns out that Cal was actually pulling a fast one. You've got classified military intel stored on your yacht. And she just brought it right to me. And he reveals that the crew that took him are actually on his side. And here is where we meet Bode, one of Cal's new companions that he's become close with over the years. What took you so long? He's equipped with a blaster and a jetpack and is basically the Han to Cal's Luke. We also meet a few other members, including the Clatoonian twins, Coob and Liz. Oh, so the puppy face people aren't always the bad guys. See, you shouldn't judge a person by their canine-like appearance. I guess not all Clatoonians are bad, so it turns out they're all part of Saul Guerrera's crew, and they're on a mission to obtain information about the Emperor and the Imperial military. They find the Senator and use some good old Jedi gaslighting to get him to produce the information they needed. Unlock it and you'll be rewarded. I'll be rewarded. I will unlock the terminal. A map showing the locations of all the Imperial forces, and they are everywhere. They're everywhere. It sounds bad when you call it Jedi gaslighting. Well, it is what it is. As Cal exits the ship, the crew is surrounded by the Empire, and the Senator asks what took them so long, but is stopped mid-sentence by an Inquisitor's lightsaber. One that belongs to Darth Trek. You have been caught harboring a traitor. That can't be a real name. Of course not. It's the ninth sister, our old friend from the last game, who's rocking a new ruby red limb after Cal handed it to her the last time they met. What is with Star Wars and cutting off people's hands? For real, and nearly all of his crew are shot, which really pisses Cal off and starts off a long overdue rematch. He gives the Inquisitor one last chance to head back in the right direction, but she refuses, so Cal removes her head altogether. <laughs> Cal and Bode manage to escape with the intelligence and get it back to Saul Guerrero, but the Mantis takes some damage on the way out. Since Cal can't just show up anywhere, being one of the Empire's most wanted and all, he decides to head to the Koba system to take the Mantis back to the person who knows it best, Grease Drydus. After a very rough landing, we look for Grease in the saloon, which is where we meet this fine fellow, Glup Shito. Wait, what? He's real? Hashtag Glup Shito confirmed? Nah, just kidding. His name is Turgle, and he's the alien comedic relief that Jar Jar was supposed to be. He's being interrogated by Bedlam Raiders led by a Jendi named Ravis, after a secret device that Turgle gave them turned out to be fake. It's fake! Wait, what's the Jendi? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the game doesn't go into too much detail on this. Basically, they're a species of aliens with regenerative tissue that live for thousands of years. Their bodies are like a giant mass of muscle, and they attach themselves to robotic suits to give them structure and a heck of a lot of firepower. Cal reveals that he's a Jedi, and after duking it out with his buddy Zeke, Ravis decides to stand down. Noble Jedi Knight, if you stay your hand, I shall withdraw in peace. 
we finally meet with Grease, who's rocking a brand new hand after he lost one in the book Jedi Battle Scars. Man, seriously, I mean, nobody can hold on to their hands in this universe, right? Like, I mean... Now, Grease has a place made up for us just in case we ever came to visit, and after a quick nap, Grease leads Cal into a tunnel to find the necessary parts to fix the Mantis. But in doing so, Cal crashes into what looks like an ancient Jedi temple. In the temple, Cal finds an ancient droid that somehow still has power. He's sent into a flashback after he touches it and reveals that the droid's name is ZNA4, aka Z. What is your name, droid? I am ZNA4, of course. How may I serve the order? Z. And it was once owned by the High Republic Jedi named Santari Kree. I'm sorry it has come to this. She gives Z a device called the Tuner, which looks exactly like the fake device that Turgo was caught giving Ravis. The Tuner not only grants the user access to certain facilities in the area, but also allows her to open something called the Forest Array, which she says, The key to Tanalor is in that array. If you do not hurry, I fear it will be lost forever. Cal saves Z from her century-long entanglements, and as Cal gets back to the saloon, Z explains that Tanalor is a place within the Kobo system that is hidden in a dangerous nebula called the Kobo Abyss. Grease had heard of it too, but thought it was only a myth. You've heard of it? Yeah, it's an old prospector's legend about a lost world filled with treasure. Now, while Grease fixes up the Mantis, Z asks Cal to fulfill her duty and open the forest array. So he heads there and uses the key to try to fire up the array. Once inside, we're met by a mysterious one-armed stranger comatose in a back to tank. Again with the hands. Yeah, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that we're gonna see a lot fewer limbs in this game than you'd expect. Anyways, the man in the back to tank is revealed in another flashback as the High Republic Jedi Dagon Gera, who was once very close with Centauri Creed. I have faith in you. So does the Council. Now it turns out that they both discover Tantalor together. Now since the planet is hidden inside a deadly nebula, the plan was to use the planet as a home for a new order of Jedi that could be kept hidden and safe from outside forces. The sweet scene is interrupted when Dagon and Santari find themselves under attack from the Nihil. What's a Nihil? The Nihil was a massive group of pirates and marauders that were the center of most conflicts during the High Republic era. Essentially one of the big bads before the Empire came to power. Now as soon as things heat up in the flashback, Dagon turns and looks at us and says, You're not supposed to be here. Sounds like something out of 112263. You shouldn't be here. When he wakes up, Dagon has his hand on the side of the tank and asks Cal to release him. We catch him up on current events as Dagon fills him in on the history of Tanalor, particularly how he betrayed the Jedi Order after they abandoned his plans. Still, we weren't beaten. Not yet. Not until the Jedi Council gave the order to abandon Tanalor and then refused to counterattack. He bleeds his lightsaber crystal, which is one of the first times we've actually seen this process happen outside of the comics or non-canon stories like Star Wars Visions. Stop! He attacks Cal, but he manages to escape after being rescued by Ravis, who's apparently his centuries-long sidekick. Ah, oh, Ravis. I should have known you would honor your oath. We head back to the Mantis, and in the most heartwarming fashion, Cal convinces Grease to join. I know things are different from how they used to be, but I'm not sure I could do this without you. Is that really how you feel? It is. And makes a plan to seek out Sare on planet Jetta for some advice on how to approach this situation. Well, isn't Jetta the planet that the Empire was plundering in Rogue One? The one and only. When they land on Jetta, they were not only reunited with Seer, but also with Marin, and even with Eno Cordova himself. Hello, my friend. It's so very good to see you again. I thought he was dead in the last game. Yeah, we kind of thought so too, but they never actually said that he died. We just kind of assumed. Anyways, Sarah reveals that she's been busy since the last time we saw her. She's been helping rebuild the Jedi Temple archives, and she works for the Hidden Path, the same one that we saw in Obi-Wan. Something that, by the way, we predicted in this video. Hold on, one of your stupid theories were, were right? Well, we did say that Sarah was likely the person who created the path, and she 100% did create the path, so we were right. Well, you're not gonna make a big deal about it, are you? Confetti! Nah, no way. So after getting some helpful Jedi archive knowledge, the team heads back to Koba and its shattered moon to retrieve two mysterious High Republic devices that they take back to Cordova. Cordova takes a look at them and thinks that he can repair them. But after Cal finds out that the hidden path has been compromised and the forces of the Empire are in the area looking for a safe house, he gets sidetracked, liberating stormtroopers from their limbs and defending the Pilgrim Sanctuary from space Nazis. Marin saves Cal's butt once again before sneaking in a kiss as they escape back to Sayre's archives where Cordova has completed his research. Right, so they're like, like a thing? Yep, they are definitely a thing. 
Cordoba reveals that it was Santari Cree who figured out how to navigate the Coba Abyss and created a device called the Compass that would help her do so. Cree invented the Abyss Compass to guide others safely to Tanalor. They also revealed that there was once a small Jedi temple on Tantalor, but it was wiped out in the Nihil conflict, a story that we've been piecing together as we force flashback throughout the game. The Jedi Order declared the temple on Tantalor to be abandoned and destroyed alongside the compasses, but Dagon didn't like that, so Santari chopped off his arm, threw him in a back to tank, and left him there. Just gonna deal with that problem later, I guess. Cal and the crew head back to Koba, and as soon as they land, our favorite froggy friend, Turgle, tells Cal that the Bedlam Raiders stole Z, their High Republic robot. They took her, Cal! Carried her right out! She's been droid napped! So now, it's up to Cal and Bode. They infiltrate the base, but Cal runs into Ravis once again, who steals the tuner from Cal. What's wrong with that? That. <laughs> That's Daggins' order. Now what's the turner again? That is the device that opens up the forest array. Cal escapes and is able to eavesdrop on a conversation between Ravis and Dagon. Ravis reveals that he's not only using Z to activate the forest array, but also that he's literally oath-bound to Dagon. And by doing this, he's honoring his oath and earned his freedom. What's that all about? Well, the Jindari were a nomadic species that all held onto their traditions, kind of like Mandalorians. Ravis was bested in combat by Dagon and bound to serve him, but since he's had to wait on his return for centuries, he's ready for retirement. After you have it, I will consider my oath to you fulfilled. Cal finally finds Z, but Dagon also finds Cal, and then they throw hands, or hand in Dagon's case. Bode shows up just in time, and Dagon makes his retreat with the tuner. With Z safe, Cal heads to the Shattered Moon to find Ravis and see if he'll give up the last compass. It's crawling with Imperial ships, but Marin is able to cloak them with a device that may just be the Shroud from Sam Higg's prequel book, Jedi Battle Scars. Once we land, Cal makes his way through the base, where we finally face off with Ravis and give him a warrior's death after he reveals the location of the last compass. Fatality. Cal then heads to Santari's observatory on Koba to get the compass and confront Dagon. The observatory base is an Imperial stronghold and it contains the hardest boss fight in the game, the dreaded Rick the Door Technician. <laughs> I just run at a promotion. Finally, at the top of the observatory, we confront Dagon in an actual boss fight, and Dagon really shows off here. Force clones, flipping gravity, he even gives himself a ghost arm, but Cal beats him on his own mind games and strikes him down. Wow, that's great. Final boss, taken down. Game over, right? Ooh, not quite. Now that Dagon is gone, nobody really knows what the best way to utilize Tantalor is, which is when Cal comes up with the idea to use it as a sanctuary for the hidden path. They bring the compass back to Jeddah, and Cordova thinks that it can be fixed. Everything's looking great for our heroes. Everyone relaxes until Bode reveals himself to be a mole. Gasp! Yeah, he's been acting a little sketchy all game, but even more so after Cal revealed his plans for Tantalor. Bode kills Cordova, and as Cal chases him down, he reveals that he's actually a secret Jedi as well. Bode uses Dagon's old lightsaber and strikes Cal down, leaving him unconscious. But don't you just respawn? I thought that's how video games work. Well, we do, but as Sare. Yeah. Sare goes ham with a one-arm saber stance and super strong force powers. She goes back to save what she can from the archive, but she's intercepted by Vader himself. Fast, fast. You okay there, Doug? Yeah, well, I just, just threw a point. This is a lot. Then we get, honestly, one of the hardest boss fights in the game. But in reality, it was such a treat, especially if you played the first game. Cal was outmatched when he took on Vader. So Sare, on the other hand, puts up a much better fight. But in the end, Vader's plot armor is thicker and Sare falls to the Dark Lord himself. Wow, the first game puts you in an unwinnable boss fight with Vader, and the second one puts you in an actual boss fight that you have to win just to actually die. Video games, man, I, I tell you. Cal is devastated when he finds Sarah's body and even starts to embrace the dark side in combat. The group tries to wrap their head around what just happened and realize that Bode's tracker is still on. His tracker shows that he's on an Imperial base inside a broken crystallized meteorite, which is as beautiful in-game as it sounds, despite knowing that it's a trap. They infiltrate the base anyways. The base is filled with Andor like scene, showing the inner conflicts and rivalries between the ISB and the Inquisitors. Cal interrogates the base's commander, Denvik, who lets us in on even more of Bode's backstory. Between that and the pieces that Bode gave him later on, we can put it all together for you. Essentially, Bode was a Republic Jedi that was undercover during Order 66. He remained undercover, doing the Empire's dirty work, until he was eventually discovered by the Inquisitors who killed his wife. So, he cut a deal with the Empire to keep his daughter safe, essentially making him a double-double agent, feeding intel to the Empire on Cal's mission for the entirety of the 
game. After doing the good old dress up like the Empire trick, we realize that the whole mission is indeed a trap. One intended to get Cal to take out the Imperial base while Boat escapes with his daughter. And it actually works. Boat is off to Tantalor and uses the compass to get there. But Cal and the crew find another way through the abyss using the arrays on Koba. Gree struggles to find a way through the nebula until Cal uses the force to jump through quickly into hyperspace and get them safe to Tantalor. Now it's final boss time as we meet both Bode and his daughter at the foot of the old Jedi Temple. After a fierce fight that includes Cal giving Bode one last chance to yield, Cal uses the blaster that Bode gave him and shoots him in front of his own daughter. Not that he had much of a choice. After the battle, Marin tries to comfort Bode's daughter. They have a funeral for Eno, Sarah, and Bode. Cal looks at the fire, wondering what to do next, for what seems like hours given the time lapse. But eventually, Sarah's force ghost comes to him and says, Guide her through the darkness. And then, credits. That's, that's, what an ending, what a story. Is it better than the first game? Oh, absolutely, which is saying a lot because Fallen Order was pretty incredible. The story is just a small part of the game. There's a bounty hunting side quest for those who want to relive the first seasons of The Mandalorian and a rooftop space garden and pretty much all of Koba to explore. There's even one side quest that literally follows game developers testing a new Hollow game, which has to be one of the most meta references in anything Star Wars ever. Also, we would be remiss if we didn't mention Scuva Stev. Clean in the filter, you think someone tried to crap even beyond the content, the game story has some fantastic elements that we've yet to see in Star Wars. Dagon, Ravis, and Bode all had different motivations, which created some of the most unique Siths that we've seen yet. Dagon was a Jedi corrupted by pride, turning himself to the dark side, while Bode simply fell due to love and attachments that he formed with his daughter. They created enemies bigger than the Empire, while still showing the magnitude of the Empire in its prime. It does a fantastic job of not only fleshing out more of the Star Wars universe, but really making you, as the player, feel like part of the universe, especially with so much you can customize about your experience. So that explains why your cow looks like the space cowboy version of Abraham from Walking Dead. Yeah, man, you gotta travel the galaxy in style, right? You can also give Cal a mullet, you know, business in front, party in the back. But more importantly, there's a lot given here for other Star Wars properties to play with. In the end, Tantalor exists and is accessible, which has a ton of possibilities. Cal and the Mantis crew can remain there indefinitely, and if it ends up being used for the hidden path, it's possible that we could see Cal Kestis show up in shows like Andor or even a Kenobi Season 2. The new Tantalorian Jedi could also show up later in the Star Wars timeline. If Kata, that's Bode's daughter, grows up on Tantalor and trains under Cal, she could lead a new Jedi faction that Rey could then use to rebuild the Jedi Order. We could even see characters like Ravik, Santari, and Deegan in Acolyte since it takes place during the High Republic era. So there's plenty of potential for plot lines that could come out of Survivor's story. And of course, all of these elements could just simply be story elements for another game. But honestly, we'd be okay with that. Hopefully we see more of Cal or his crew because this was one hell of an adventure and a must play for any Star Wars gamer. What do you guys think about Jedi Survivor? Where do you think we'll see Cal next? Let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.